Professor Thiruvengadam is the teaching faculty at the Azim Premji University. We have a brief video which we'll play before Professor Thiruvengadam takes over. Thousands of people marched through the streets of New Delhi on Sunday to celebrate the city's annual gay pride parade. I just arrived today for the gay pride and I'm here because I'm for equality. India's Supreme Court three years ago reinstated Section 377 of the Constitution, which criminalizes gay sex. However, a petition that seeks to re-examine the 2013 judgment is pending before a five-judge bench of the Supreme Court. Members of the LGBT community and their supporters want the court to reverse its decision. So I'm straight and I have a lot of friends who are gays and lesbians. But I think it is very important for people like us to come and support it. Activists say that since the law was reinstated, members of the LGBT community have increasingly become targets of extortion and violence. I think you're seeing some new violence because some of that pullback and legitimacy has been eroded a little bit. But I think the biggest challenge for us in the movement right now is that there are particular parts of the movement, for example, working class trans folks, right, who are increasingly at the front line of a kind of criminal justice and police violence. The World Bank estimates that workplace discrimination against members of the LGBT community could cost India billions of dollars in lost productivity. LGBT activists say they are hopeful that the Supreme Court will rule in their favour when it takes up the matter in the coming months. Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Ferreira. Celebrations broke out on Thursday as the LGBTQ community and others welcomed the Supreme Court judgment decriminalizing consensual gay sex, asserting that the historic verdict granted them a basic human right, but also acknowledging that complete equality was still some distance away. A five-judge constitution bench of the Supreme Court unanimously decriminalized part of the 158-year-old colonial law under Section 377 of the Indian Penal Court, which criminalizes consensual unnatural sex, prompting joyous tears, hugs and dancing across the country. Activists, members of the LGBTQ community, authors and politicians welcome the verdict, which also said society cannot dictate a sexual relationship between consenting adults, with many cutting cakes and unfurling the rainbow flag. Not nervous. I was very calm. Like I slept peacefully. That's what I got several messages on my WhatsApp saying that I'm nervous. I'm nervous. And I said no. I'm peaceful. Right now, I'm feeling very jittery, very nervous, very excited. You know, previously we have had bad judgments from Supreme Court, so there was a side of nervousness as well. I was very, very optimistic. Very optimistic. I think uh, when you argue cases, you build a sense of the responses you're getting in court, and I think the arguments went really well. Thank you all for coming. Let me start uh, by saying uh, for everybody who's been here since morning, uh, this has turned out to be a very uh, exciting and unusual event uh, where the focus is uh, very much on uh, students and undergraduate students who are with us. Uh, in, in that sense, I think what is heartwarming and we, we've been discussing since morning about uh, the overall climate uh, in the country. And I think one way uh, people in the progressive uh, community would think uh, would be to think of the future, right? And in that sense, the idea of a national convention on the Constitution is a wonderful idea, and I'm very happy to be here, as I'm sure uh, my co-panelists. Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking of time. We, are, uh, we have one hour for this session. Uh, I'll start by introducing both the panelists, and then we'll 
uh, have 15 minutes for each speaker, uh, and that will allow us hopefully a half an hour for a discussion of the themes that we've been discussing since morning. So in the first session, uh, Professor Mahajan took us through uh, the importance of history to understand our constitutional context uh, and the contemporary situation. In the second panel, uh, uh, Hasina Khan and Akkai Padmashali took us through their experiences and we discussed and we started coming closer to the contemporary context. Uh, this session takes that forward. Uh, the formal uh, topic is gender and sexuality in the Supreme Court and the video that we saw talked about the Navtej Singh Johar uh, case, but I, I think uh, Flavia will also talk about the role of gender when we talk about uh, equality. Uh, and how do we take, and the, if you've read the brief descript, uh, description of the panel, uh, the idea is also to engage with a theme that we talked about in the previous section about religion and group rights and how do they intersect with notions of gender and sexuality uh, in India. Uh, I'm very privileged to be part of this wonderful panel. Uh, both Flavia uh, and Arvind, uh, I've known them for, for a while and I think they're wonderfully positioned to talk about these issues. Uh, both of them, uh, as you will see, are very, have very individual perspectives, but I was struck by the fact that in some ways they have very uh, similar uh, trajectories as, as far as coming to this, these issues are concerned. So um, as Flavia was telling us uh, over the tea break, uh, she uh, is certainly a lawyer, but she says, I don't think of myself as a practicing lawyer alone. Uh, somebody was talking about her teaching and she then disclaimed being an academic. Uh, but uh, in, in that sense, what's, un what's common to both of them is they founded very important organizations uh, Majlis in Bombay, Alternative Law Forum in Bangalore. Initially, uh, these organizations started as local uh, organizations responding to local needs, but I think uh, today they have a national presence and a national impact, uh, and, and people across the nation would know what these organizations have done. Uh, Majlis was co-founded by Flavia in 1990. Uh, ALF, uh, Arvind is one of the founders, and ALF started in 2000. So uh, the, the times that these organizations were founded and the issues they've canvassed also tell us a little about uh, human rights and civil rights in India across a uh, long trajectory. Um, as I mentioned, both of them uh, also have a record of engaging both with scholarly work and with writing in, in uh, news media. Uh, and, and that's something, uh, one of the things, I, I'm now a full-time academic and I'm very conscious that each of them has a publications record which would put many full-time academics to shame. Uh, and in that sense, what they, they have this quality of being able to engage with multiple worlds uh, through their work. So through activism, uh, through scholarly uh, engagement, uh, and with interacting with, with the public at large, and I think they're wonderfully positioned uh, to be here. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll request each of them uh, to, to speak for 15 minutes. I think the idea, you don't have to be cabined by gender and sexuality, and, uh, but, but the idea is that you know these areas uh, very well, and you could probably position your remarks from there, uh, but also talk about uh, uh, things beyond that. Yeah. So, Flavia, 15 minutes, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. It's always so nice to be here. You know, when I see uh, people like Arvind and Arun, uh, I feel extremely uncomfortable because that reminds me how old I am. If they have become so senior, then imagine I am ancient compared to that. So I feel very awkward to be part of a panel like this, but in a way also comfortable because I know them for so long. And uh, somewhere we, our views are shaped by similar contemporary events, both within the realm of law as well as outside. It's not just law, but also the social reality around us. And it shapes, uh, constantly shapes and reformulates one's views on many things. Uh, and then you theorize from there, at least my theorization and writings are based on the work that I do on the ground because uh, as Arun rightly said, I'm not an academician, uh, but I write. So that's the dichotomy over there. Uh, but I write not by quoting authorities, but very grounded work on our experiences at Matlis. Um, <clears throat> also, when I read a judgment of the Supreme Court or any high court or any judgment, 
I also test it against the ground reality. To what extent it can be implemented or what can extent it is sort of talking in the air and has no ground connection. Now when we talk about gender and Article 14 and 15, we don't only talk about gender and patriarchy within our constitution. We, that would have been very simple and straightforward. But constantly we are talking about Article 14 and 15 counterposed with Article 25 and 26. Both are uh, in a way, um, both are in a way fundamental rights. Not to be placed one above the other. Individual rights as a, as a uh, woman or within the context of sexuality and the group rights, whether it is of a particular community, group beliefs, uh, Article 25, 26, how they constantly are posed against each other. And the challenge before the Supreme Court becomes extremely difficult to place one above the other, as we've seen in the Sabarimala case. I'm not here to speak on Sabrimala case, but it's just faith communities, belief communities, and what they, the influence they have on the ground, or the way political parties can manipulate that belief uh, constantly, is coming before us and give, posing a very severe challenge to viewing gender as a purely Article 14 and 15 uh, principle or theory. I don't want to get into a Sabrimala, basically because it is very complex. The four uh, judges have given one side of the view. The fifth judge, a woman judge, has given a contrary view. And all of them are valid views from the perspective of a course. That Sabrimala judgment, in a way, can be compared to Shabani judgment of 1986-85. That was again pitted community against gender. And that also created a backlash. Then it uh, led to another judgment. Now this time we see a review petition being filed and they'll be heard. And it is to be seen what the Supreme Court will do. So when we're writing about gender, we're constantly writing about also the ground reality. And how does it get uh, <clears throat> interspersed with each other? And to what extent can we reach out? Now, similarly, in the earlier session, the LGBTQ, the Supreme Court judgment, 377 has come. But how does it come to the ground when Akkai was Akkama? Okay. Uh, so <coughs> she said people don't even, after the word sex, they feel ashamed. So from there, where do you go forward? And how do you actually um, reach out? So now, having said this, let me talk about the triple talaq judgment. If you really want to know, it's a very compl complex judgment, 400 uh, pages, uh, three different views, which are very different kind of views. Uh, before that, I want to say one more thing. Uh, if it is purely gender, and we were, like for uh, 1980, when the women's group said, Started, we said all of us are equal and all of us need equal rights. That was the position of women's groups in 1980. And from there, we moved on to see we cannot see gender purely. Now, here, uh, somewhere, there was a um, trust from the women's organization side towards a uniform civil code. That we need a uniform civil code. And why do we need a uniform civil code? Because Muslim women have no rights. In, among Muslims, there is... Uh, Polygamy, Muslims have uh, triple talaq. There, <coughs> and inference being, if you have a UCC, then Muslim women will have rights. No, the inference being Hindu women have rights. That's more important. Hindu women have rights. Other women, minority women don't have rights. Hence, we need a UCC. Within the context of the legal pluralism, which many of us adhere to, and which is getting popularized in many Western countries, there is a 
trust that different communities, when they migrate, they migrate with their law, they take their law with you, their, their customs with you. And in order to situate the rights, we have to look at the customs and rituals of that community. And within that, we have to place gender. And hence, different legal systems have to be um, oriented towards gender justice rather than one single law. Now, I've been saying this, and I've been pro a proponent of this since the 19, 1990s, particularly after the Babri Masjid demolition and the riots that followed in Mumbai, where I was very um, gr engaged with it on the ground and seeing Muslim women's situations, and followed by Gujarat riots 2001. Now, by the time Gujarat riots happened, many women's groups changed their view. And they said, we do not want a UCC, and let's find out other ways. But before that, by the, when I was saying this, I received a lot of criticism that I'm not really a feminist, and how can I say this? But 2001, other people also started saying this, and women's movement in a way split. But still, the thrust was towards, like, we need some uniformity. And the judges also said, we need some uniformity. And in this context, a law commission was commissioned to look at the issue of use, implementing UCC. Law commission functions under, under the law ministry, appointed by them, uh, headed by a retired Supreme Court judge. And when the report came on the last day, August 31st was the term ended of this particular commission. And the commission brought out a report saying that uniform civil code is not feasible, not required. We need to look at each personal laws when we need to see what is going wrong in each personal laws. And what they highlighted was Hindu undivided family property and several other lacuna in the Hindu law. And because of it, media gave it no attention. Had they said, yeah, Muslim, uh, Muslims, the Muslim women need uniform civil code to ensure their rights, it would have been like TV debates and newspapers would have covered it extensively. Such an important document that came out, I don't think you all are aware of it. I want to know how many of you were aware of it. Uh, it talks about UCC and the... Yeah, how many are like, uh, just like very few. But if I said that you are, UCC is um, uh, propagated by this or advised by this, recommended by this, all of you would have known it because it would have been so much high profile. How many of you have read the recommendations? They're more important. There is a recommendation there, and what it talks about is different personal laws. And something I have consistently said that different personal laws need different kind of changes. Like I'm a Christian, my law is patriarchal, but I need reform with it, which is not required for a Hindu woman. For instance, our uh, our uh, a law amend was got amended in 2001, where mutual consent divorce was added. Till then, mutual consent divorce was not there for Christians at all. And they had to go through a roundabout circuitous way to get that uh, uh, uniform, uh, get that uh, right. Then with the amendment, we got cruelty as a ground for divorce and we got mutual consent to divorce. And we were very happy and we didn't need anything more, actually. But this is not the concern of a Muslim woman because Muslim women is exactly on the other side where the, the talaq happens very easily and quickly. Where, where uh, marriage is a contract. Whereas Hindu and Christian uh, view marriage as a sacrament as an indissoluble um, sacrament, because of which prenup agreement cannot be um, introduced in Hindu law or Special Marriage Act, which the government again and again and again wants to do, prenup contract for NRI marriages, this and that. And every time they hold a meeting and a call, I said, first you have to accept that Hindu marriage is a contract. Only when you do this, we can go to the next step. And there, they back out and they say, no, Hindu marriage cannot be a contract. Can you imagine, after 1955 law, today we have moved 60 years, and today also our legislatures and our bureaucrats think Hindu marriage is not a contract. So you can imagine what the pu common public thinks about Hindu marriage act, that Saptapadi, the Kanyadan, all becomes essential rituals of a Hindu marriage. And we very seldom talk about it. We always talk about Hindu law, Muslim, uh, Muslim law, Muslim community, is regressive, this and that. All communities are regressive. Including a Christian community is regressive. Uh, you know the bishop's case, Jalandar Bishop, rape of the nun, um, even sexual harassment policy is not there. So each of us are, if I'm working among Muslims, I will see Muslim, and I'm a feminist, I will say Muslim law is like this. But if I'm a Hindu, we're not called as Hindu as a community. But we say, look around, we say customs and rituals, and we can see how much discrimination is there, including the Sabri issue. And including, see the backlash just on menstruation. That women 
are having this uh, menstruate, so they are not pure. The whole issue of purity. Now, these are the general milieu in which we operate. So, into which we have to look at this triple talak judgment. And the triple talak judgment, uh, in the three different views, says so very different things. Each of, the, each of the view is different from the other. The basic thing here is, for me, this triple talak judgment was not required at all because it has moved once, not moved one step forward from the 2002 Shami Mara judgment. Now, Shami Mara judgment is based on a, a Gohati High Court judgment of 1981, two judgments. One is single judge and one is uh, uh, division bench. Well, extremely good judgments in 1981. You will be surprised that so-called activists, all of us, did not even look at that judgment, did not use it anywhere else. But when uh, so many judgments came, uh, uh, Madras High Court judgment came, Bangalore High Court, uh, Karnataka High Court judgment, Delhi High Court, all of that, Bombay High Court, so many judgments were there. Uske sab humne nazar andas kar diya. Uske baad mein 2002 judgment aya. That is Shami Maharaj judgment which came, uh, which clearly said that there is a procedure for uh, talaq laid down in the Quran and if you have not followed the, uh, that procedure, then it is not valid. Uh, talaq is not valid, 2002. 2005, we got a domestic violence act, which put uh, all categories of violence, abuse, everything. Uh, and all, it was universal, it was uniform in that sense. Uh, every woman can apply to it. Even then, there was no debate about Muslim women can apply it. Now, our organization, Majlis, has been using either both Shami Mara and DV Act together for Muslim women. Consistently. And many uh, NGOs who work in Mumbai uh, and get, they do counseling, they do other things, but the cases come to us. When the cases come to us, we take them to court. And when you take them to court, now under the Domestic Violence Act, she has right whether she's divorced or not divorced. Whether it's valid or invalid divorce, DV gives you the right. All women have been married or are married. 2002 gives you the right that this talaq is not valid at all. And we have the 1986 Act, which is post Shabanu, which is, according to me, an extremely progressive piece of legislation, which ensured that a divorced Muslim woman is entitled to a lump sum settlement. But it's not only the uh, um, 2001 uh, Daniel Latifi judgment, but from 1986 to 2001, several uh, high courts had said Muslim Women uh, Act gives Muslim women rights at a pro uh, post divorce rights for a lump sum settlement, and this is laid out in the Quran. So now you have 1986 Act, you have 2001 Daniel Latifi judgment, you have 2002 Shami Mara judgment, and you have the 19, uh, 2005 uh, DV Act. Now, when we started taking Muslim Women's Act under the DV Act, the opposite side, the lawyer would come and say, they are not entitled to rights. Uh, DB that is not applicable to Muslim women. And then they would take the matter to high court. It went, it went down three, four times, but they withdrew just before a judgment could come. Because when they thought they were losing, they backed out. After that, the issue was not there. So all I want to say is that why I think is not relevant. Though there was so much high publicity, all the media was talking about it. And they were talking about Shaira Banu's violence. Sharabano's violence, that she was abused by her husband, she was made to do multiple abortions, her health had failed, she was not allowed to meet her parents. Each of them is an issue of domestic violence. It never got discussed in the media. Her husband had filed a restitution of conjugal rights to call her back. And she had approached the Supreme Court, saying that I don't want to go back. It was only when she went to Supreme Court, I don't want to go back, that her husband gave her a written talaknama. It was not oral, it was a talaknama sent to her, which is a strategy all lawyers follow. Now, the violence upon Shah Banu, Shah, Shaira Banu becomes so important because she's Muslim. Hindu women also go through similar violence. We never pick it up. Hindu women are killed for dowry, we never pick it up. It's become a three, three uh, line uh, in the back, uh, eight page of the newspaper. We never, it's so routine. Violence on Hindu women has become so normalized, so routine, that we now only cry for our Muslim sisters, including our Prime Minister.
They are more deliberate Muslim, uh, my Muslim sisters. Not his own wife. That is the most important part. Even if you record it's okay, I, I have no problem. Anti-national or whatever label. But what I'm talking about is there are problems for every, everywhere. But somewhere in a campaign, we want to make issues. Uh, when we say um, this case should not have gone to Supreme Court because the rights were in the local courts. What is the right she needed maintenance? What is the right she needed access to her children? What is the right she needs uh, a shelter? Which is all given in the Domestic Violence Act. But there is no mention of Domestic Violence Act. In, not only in media, not only in the Supreme Court, but not even among women's organizations who claim to be representing Muslim women or who claim to be working for Muslim uh, women's rights. And that is the tragedy I find. So now uh, Shahir Banu judgment came. Uh, we would see pictures of women exchanging laddus and this and that, so happy. Now re revolution has happened. Three months later, people are saying this law doesn't work because uh, triple talaq still happens. It's like saying now we have death penalty for uh, the rape of children under 12, but rape of children still happens. We never say that. Because the law is to punish a wrongdoer. Law, law deterrent has never worked in a country. And yet we are now into moving into criminalization and I hold several women's organizations solely responsible for this were not accessing their rights from 90, at least from 2002 onwards, uh, not being aware of it, not being write, writing about it. So that leaves me like my friend in Hyderabad, Sunita, she says, but maybe only you talk about Shamimara. Nobody else talks about it. I said, it's their problem, not my problem. It's a Supreme Court judgment and we have to use it. Today, people are going back and said, we, today. We have domestic violence act. Why do we need a criminalization? If they had said all these years that we, uh, Muslim women have rights under DBE and had worked on it, this situation would not have come. This campaign would not have come. Particularly, I'm talking about groups like BMA and uh, Hasina, all of the previous speakers, all of them. Had they used this law before? Had they said this before for the last 15 years? And had the media highlighted this? The, uh, like, I was writing, but that's not enough. You need like 100 people to write, you need 50 people to write and say this. And by saying now, we become like too late. Because now we have given the issue to the BJP. BJP has picked it up. BJP has made Muslim women a political capital. And there are five women who Supreme, went to Supreme Court, half of them have joined the BJP. So what does it tell us about the Shahir Abanu case itself? I, I'm not even going into judgment, we, uh, the, analyzing the judgment, but I just want to tell you the social milieu within which this judgment has come and what is given to us is criminalization. That everybody said, we need a law, we need a law, we need a law. Uh, um, Hasina and her group said, uh, uh, BMMA said, they wrote a letter to Modi. All that happened, for what purpose? Does the law give you the rights? Ultimately, I want to say, does the law give you rights? Or when you go to court taking an individual case and putting real hard labor, at least winning one case, do one case, one case of rape, one case of Muslim women, do one case. And according to me, then you have an authority to speak. Otherwise, campaign is so easy. Just press this, click this. We have so many endorsements, 50,000, 1 lakh. What does it mean on the ground? According to me, it doesn't mean anything. Thank you. Thank you, Flavia. Uh, we'll hold questions. Uh, Flavia has kept up to her reputation of being contrarian and, and asking tough questions. But I think if you're thinking of the Constitution's future, we also want to provoke debate amongst ourselves about what strategy. It's not about getting everybody to agree on something, but to think deeply about it. And, and thank you, Flavia, uh, for, for your remarks. I'll ask Arvind to speak uh, again for 15 minutes, and then we'll throw open uh, the floor for questions. So please uh, keep uh, your questions. I'll keep a queue, and then we'll come back to you. Last session, Akai did a lot of the hard work of communicating the struggle against Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code. It was a 25-year-old struggle, if you take the fact that the first petition was filed in ABVA, by ABVA in 1994, and the judgment we got in Avtej Singh Johar was in 2018. And I think what is very important about Akai's presentation is that she communicated that the end of the day, any change in the law happens because of a level of grassroots kind of a struggle. Changes in the law don't happen from the backroom context. It happens from people who are out there in the front lines uh, waging a, a wide struggle on the streets, as it were. I'm going to take a slight bit of a back step and take you through some of the high points and the low points of the 25-year-old struggle against the law to try and perhaps highlight some of what 
is precious and valuable of the Constitution and what the LGBT struggle has contributed to our interpretation or thinking of the Indian Constitution itself. The law came in 1860, 1950 we had the Indian Constitution and 1950 to 2009, uh, no court ever saw fit to interpret the right to equality or the right to dignity or the right to privacy as being a part or apply to LGBT communities themselves. The first time that happened was in 2009 when Justice Shah and Justice Mulidhar of the Delhi High Court uh, gave a fantastic judgment where they argued that Section 377 violated the right to equality, the right to privacy, the right to dignity, and they introduced a very new notion called constitutional morality. Again, where does the idea of constitutional morality come from? Why is it relevant for us? The idea of constitutional morality, if you go back to the Constituent Assembly debates, the person who introduces the idea of constitutional morality is Dr. Ambedkar. And the way he puts it, he says constitutional morality is not a natural sentiment. Our people have yet to learn it. We have to cultivate it. He goes on to say that democracy in India is a top dressing on a soil which is essentially undemocratic. The argument Dr. Ambedkar is making is that if you think of India being run purely in terms of majoritarian sentiment and majority opinion, then we don't have democracy in this country. To have a democracy in this country, you've got to think of democracy within the limits of the Constitution, and you think of the idea of majority opinion as being subject to the norms of the Constitution. So the court, in effect, said in this case that, end of the day, the rights of the LGBT community are not subject to any transient majority. It doesn't matter what the majority thinks. What matters is the fact that the right to dignity and the right to equality of the LGBT community is not subject to the norms of the morality. Again, this is an important contribution because Justice Shah picked it up in 2009. After that, if you look at the recent array of judgments, be it the Sabrimala judgment, be it the adultery judgment, it's the language of constitutional morality which is being used to saying that as far as the right to live, the right to exist, the right to be who you are, that cannot be subject to the norms and morality of the majority. It's a very important contribution in terms of thinking about what does democracy mean in the Indian context. That's 2009. 2013, of course, we had a reversal of the judgment, which uh, Vikram said described most powerfully as a bad day for law and love. It's a bad day for love because if you choose to love somebody, surely we can't be living in a country which criminalizes your right to love across lines of gen gender, lines of sexuality, or lines of caste. And it's a bad day for law, because if you go again to the question of what, what is the heart of the 2013 judgment, they basically said, let parliament decide. They said these rights are so-called rights of the LGBT community. And they also went on to make the point that, you know, it's a minuscule minority. How does it matter? The response to this comes in 2017 in the privacy judgment by nine, nine judges of the Indian Supreme Court. And the point they make in the privacy judgment in response specifically to Kaushal, the point they make is minuscule minor, minorities or mi minuscule majorities, how we choose to phrase it, is not a relevant concept in Indian constitutional law. Every person has rights under the Indian constitution, regardless of what a majority or a minority you may be. So they dismiss the notion of minuscule minority. The second point they make is when the court in, in Kaushal says so-called rights of LGBT communities, Justice Chandrachud's opinion is, these are not so-called rights, but real rights dwelling in privacy and dwelling in dignity. The third point he makes is when you look at the entire notion of let parliament decide, again, his point there is we cannot allow the rights of a minority, especially the right to dignity and the right to equality, to be subject to the norms of, the, norms of either, either parliamentary, or either legislative, or popular majorities. Again, a very important invocation in today's time, when the idea that your rights could be subject to the norms of the majority is something we have to critique and we have to contest, and where the language of the court in which we can talk about this particular notion. That's the broad trajectory leading up to 2018. The only reason I made that point is to make the point again that there's a long history to this battle and to the struggle against this, this particular law. When the judgment came, were we happy? Were we unhappy? Did we welcome it? I think across the country we were extraordinarily happy with the judgment. Why we were so happy with the judgment is because it went a little beyond what our expectations might have been. And I want to tell you in the next little time that I have left, why did it go beyond our expectations? What were the points in the judgment which made it such an extraordinary judgment? Why did it become such a document of the struggle in, a, in, a, in, 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 the, in that sense? Firstly, the judge, the point I want to make about the judgment is the tonality of the judgment. 
Every judgment you can think of, I can think of, is really the judges speaking in the language of authority, language of order, they're telling you what they think. This is the first judgment which I've read, where when Justice Indu Malhotra makes the point that uh, history owes an apology to LGBT people and their families for the ostracism and the ignominy that they've suffered down the centuries. It's a very important starting point of even think, beginning to think about justice. Justice Chandrachur communicates this very powerfully. He says that, you know, the Constitution came into place in 1950. The law was there since 1860. For the last 70 years, we have done nothing about the rights of the LGBT community. And he makes a very powerful one line. He says, civilization has been brutal. In that one line, in that one phrase, is acknowledged an entire history of violation and suppression of the LGBT community. So the judgment begins with an acknowledgement of the wrong the judiciary has done in not taking forward, not acknowledging that LGBT people are citizens and entitled to full rights under the Indian Constitution. Starting from that viewpoint, the judges then go on to recognize, in particular Justice Deepak Mishra's opinion, where they go on to make the point that the right to intimate choice is a right which every person has. And Justice Deepak Mishra locates that in the right to individuality, he quotes Gute, where he makes the point that I am what I am, take me as I am, right? And the point being that individuality is the core aspect of who you are. And the individuality is closely linked in his notion to the idea of dignity and the idea of privacy. Privacy, again, in the notion of the privacy judgment, which is, which is, which is played out in, in this judgment as well, is the idea that uh, you have a right to make choices about your intimate life. It's not just the notion that what I do in the privacy of my bedroom is my business. It's more important than that. It's about saying that when I make decisions about my intimate life, be it the right to have a child, be it the right to abortion, be it the right to have a loving relationship with the person of my choice, regardless of sex or gender, that's a part of my right to choice. Again, where do they derive this right to choice from? You look at the, the trajectory of cases cited. They derive it from the Shafia Jahan case, which is talking about the right to choose, choose religion, talking about the right to cho choice of partner. They derive it from the Shakti Vaini case, where they're talking about the right to, uh, right to choose partners, again, regardless of what families or parents might think, and the idea of individuality of choice. And again, the, 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 the triangulation you can think of in this, guy, in this case is how does right to autonomy, right to privacy, and the right to dignity come together in terms of, uh, in terms of this, this, uh, this, particular, this particular judgment? That's the first point I want to make. The second closely related point is Justice Chandrachur's invocation of the right to love. Again, why is the right to love important? It is, of course, important because you have the right to love people across lines of gender, sexuality, and caste. And that's something I think, uh, I imagine, many of us in this room would, would agree upon. But there's one level beyond which Justice Chandrachur goes. He makes the point that the right to love is not just for the LGBT community, but it's all of us. And the point he's making there, he says that when you're talking about the idea of natural and unnatural, in the Indian context, you're not just talking about relationships across lines of gender and sex. You're talking about the possibility of relationships across lines of caste and religion as well. So when you're talking about defending the right to love, in effect, you're defending, you're shaking, you're questioning the structures of, soci of, of Indian society, particularly the lines of caste and religion. I think very, very recently, we've seen a range of cases where people in this country still get killed for daring to love across lines of religion and caste. And it's a question of a defense, or it's a question of a challenge to these fundamental structures which are being articulated as far as um, this judgment is concerned. From there, I want to go to the one more notion, which is, again, what is the opposition to Section 377? Of course, we oppose it because it deprives us of the right to love across lines of, uh, uh, right to love. That's fundamental. It deprives us of the right to intimate choice. That is fundamental. But one level beyond that is the argument which Justice Chandrachut makes. He says that the, the problem with the law is that it encodes a prejudice and discrimination in wider society itself. The prejudice and discrimination which is there in the law moves from the law to a popular consciousness, to legal consciousness, to cultural consciousness. If tomorrow and today and, and day after tomorrow, if people, if transgender people, if, if LGBT people 
face violence or discrimination in, in healthcare settings when you go and get a passport, it's because this is certain prejudicial way in which LGBT people are viewed by the state and the state and the uh, and various authorities. And the argument he's making is that prejudicial attitude or way of thinking comes from this law. So our opposition to the law comes from the fact that fundamentally that this law encodes a certain prejudice and a certain bias as far as thinking against LGBT people uh, is concerned. So these are the, in a sense, the frameworks or the reasons why this, uh, why the critique, why Justice Chandrachud uh, and, 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 the, uh, and the judges put forward a deep critique of the law. From here, they go on to two other very, very important notions. From here, Justice Chandrachud and, and Justice Mishra go on to the notion of the idea of, of constitutional morality. I refer to this again. And this again links up to something which Flavia said, and something that other speakers have said as well. End of the day, this law will go today. Prejudice and discrimination might still remain. So how do you continue to question or combat this prejudice and this discrimination? And that's where the idea of constitutional morality becomes very, very important. The idea that fundamentally, what is our role, what is our task, what is the wider task which all of us have, is how do you change uh, Indian society's way of thinking, which could be within norms of societal morality, into a form of constitutional morality? How do you ensure there's a greater respect for the idea of individual choice, the greater respect for the idea of the dignity of the individual person, regardless of what society thinks, regardless of what religion or morality might think? And the last notion they go to from here, which is the idea of a transformative constitution. Again, what do they mean by a transformative constitution? What they mean by a transformative constitution is to go back again to the heart of the Indian constitution. The idea that the constitution is not only, the Indian constitution is not only a bulwark against the authority or the repressive authority of the state. It's also a bulwark against the repressive authority of society. And I think that's a very important point because we all know that society is a, can be a deeply repressive institution when it comes to the question of caste, it comes to the question of gender, it comes to the question of sexuality. In a sense, if you look at something, a provision in the Indian Constitution like Article 17, what is Article 17 really about? Again, if you go back, I mean, since we're, we're among law students, if you go back and read the Sabrimala judgment, and in particular, read Justice Chandrachur's judgment in the Sabrimala judgment, and read his particular invocation of what is the meaning of Article 17, right? He's saying Article 17 is, is, a, is a form of compensation or reparation for wrongs which have historically been perpetrated against the Dalit community for centuries, right? So the point which comes from there is the Indian constitution is not only about the state. It's also about saying how our society must transform. And it must transform if it have a, a society which is more just on grounds of caste or gender or sexuality. So I think the last point, I'll end with this, is that End of the day, I agree with a lot of the speakers who say that a change in the law is not enough. But I think the root the judgment provides us is really this. What they, the point they're making again and again is that we have done a bit. We have struck down or, put, or, or, or uh, put down this particular law. Now the job is everybody else's. Because we have to cultivate, again if we go back to Ambedkar, when he talks about how do you cultivate a constitutional morality. Cultivation of constitutional morality is a task which all of us have. And maybe they'll link up to, your, to the last session you guys have, which is the task of a grouping such as this is how do you take forward an idea of constitutional morality, which is really not only about critiquing the state, it's also about transforming the way Indian society functions, in particular with respect to certain tradition and hidebound norms, be it patriarchy, be it caste prejudice, or be it prejudice on grounds of uh, sexuality or uh, Gender. I stop with that. Yeah. Thank you, Arvind, um, for sticking to time and, and for raising a uh, profound question. So uh, we're just expanding the ambit of the, the, the topic for this panel. It's gender, sexuality, which both speakers have addressed. Arvind's also asked us to think about caste. Um, we, 
we haven't talked about class yet, but we, we've got one more session where we'll talk about what is an inclusive constitution. Uh, so lots of uh, questions. We have, we have to end at one, so we have time for one round of questions. Uh, I'll, I'll take three questions and get the panel to respond. I'll have to be selective and arbitrary, unfortunately. Uh, but hopefully the idea is also that... Uh, maybe we'll have questions... Yeah, so if everybody just keeps it, just maybe highlight uh, a point or issue that you want to raise, and we'll collect three to start with, and then get the speakers to respond. And remember, the, there's always time for conversations over lunch okay, as well. In the Sharaban judgment, uh, Justice Kurian Joseph spent some time talking about how triple talaq was un-Islamic rather than unconstitutional. So, it's, so judges by uh, definition are experts in law, not in theology. So... Would, is such an approach misguided or is it useful in sort of pacifying a community that, well, some individuals in that community who might be outraged by a judicial interference in what they believe is their own personal law? Uh, Ma'am, could you please uh, enlighten on uniform and common civil code, please? Ma'am, you said you test judgment on ground realities. So are there any touchstone for it or some objective? How could a normal person could check a judgment on the uh, ground level. Good afternoon to the esteemed panel. My question is to ma'am. <laughs> to both the panelists, um, whoever can choose to answer this one. So I have been working with this organization called Zaria and talking to many of the people I have come to know that in domestic violence cases, a lot of women go to the NGOs which are sponsored by the government, which, are, which have been working through the government. And what they do is, they try reconciling the marriage and do not realize that the woman has faced a lot of horrific things in her life. And they somehow try forcing her into that same marriage. So, uh, yes, so do you think it's because of the whole lack of gender sensitivity in our institutions and education? I mean, that's all, thank you. That is, I come from Kerala and I have seen this approach that the Sabriamala issue has made in Kerala. Even my, I uh, study in uh, GLC, Ernakulam. So my friends who studies in the law school, they are all against, uh, they, we have a lot, a large proportion of students who are against this judgment and who uh, go for this protest and all. Even faculty, I have debated with my faculty and she was even telling like the court is not having the right to intervene into our right to religion. So uh, I would like to uh, know your opinion regarding the dissenting judgment made by Justice Hindu Malhotra and uh, how uh, we can balance between both this religious right and the right to equality. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Anoshka. So a lot of the judgments previously have been, a lot of people have turned them as judicial activism and they believe the Supreme Court has in overreach of its powers. So basically I'd like to ask you your opinion on that. Sabri Mala uh, judgment itself, I think as law students, very important all of you read the read the judgments in full and see why, what what is the reasoning which appeals to you, what you agree with as it were, right? I think to me, the judgment, uh, Justice Chandrachud's uh, opinion is compelling in terms of the case that uh, when you have a law which is based on a stereotype, the stereotype that as when women who menstruate are impure, and that stereotype cannot be the basis of any law. And if there's a stereotype such as that, that law runs full of Article 15. That's the kind of logic he puts forward. The second logic he puts forward, which is very interesting, again, is Article 17. Right? When you talk about the idea of, of untouchability, right? and the idea that, sure, we're talking about untouchability in runs of caste, but in our society, in Hindu society, till today, we have the idea of ritual impurity of, of women during menstruation in, in Hindu society across the board. Should that change? That's the question he's asking you. So I'm saying as people who read judgments, we should look at those and say that, you know, surely our point should be Indian society must transform in these particular directions. Um, the Sabri Malay judgment, even I want to comment here on uh, Justice Indu Malhotra's uh, judgment, where she uh, not necessarily counters what uh, Justice Chandrachu is saying, but she brings in the aspect of 25, 26 people's beliefs to what extent Supreme Court can lead the direction for this. Now, what I feel about Supreme Court, uh, the Sabrimala judgment, was that uh, it was more on top rather than from down below, as against the LGBTQ community where people were coming out and saying that this is my right. I have, I have right to love. Uh, nobody can see uh, or, or I cannot be under fear of arrest. And uh, coming out in the open means that the police can take action against me or distortion, all these issues that were there. Now, Sabrimala judgment, what did happen, while I agree 
completely with Justice Chandrachud's argument about Article 17 and menstrual impurity. Uh, what I feel is that we as a community, particularly Brahminical ethos that function amongst us, in our homes, with our maids, everywhere, that even my maid cannot go to my neighbor's house when she's menstruating. Or my maid said she will not water my plants because she's menstruating. And I said, what is this rubbish? You will water my plants. And I gave her the whole history that when you're menstruating, you're more fertile and it's much better for the plants, etc. And then, surprisingly, my plants grew better than my neighbors. And now she's convinced that uh, this is fine. And uh, menstruation is part of, like she believes in Dastra, Devi, this, that, and all. Part of menstru menstruation is part of Devi. Uh, and the plants are part of Devi. So you are connecting with Devi but by this. Uh, and not allowing you and having some uh, Ganpati or made out of stone or brass or whatever. I said, there's no God in that. There's God in you. So now she is conveying. Now what I say is that whole, because it challenges menstrual impurity, which I'm fully with it. But what I do feel is that and what the, uh, the law college, etc. are saying is that there's no ground level movement that came with this judgment. So it is something up there and it cannot connect down. And the way uh, like BJP is exploiting the situation uh, and politicizing it, uh, where I feel somewhere this judgment became instrumental in that. Supreme Court, the lawyer community, the argument that went, everything is fine, I have no issue with that. But when it comes at only that level and does not support the movement on the ground, or there's no movement on the ground. So uh, what now the believers say that they come, uh, people who want to, women who want to come, come as tourists. They're not believers. They're not devotees. And the devotees say, we do not want to go because we want uh, uh, Lord Ayapa's blessings. And we don't want to uh, invite his wrath. And I only say that the floods in Kerala, thank God they happened before the judgment. Imagine what would have happened after the judgment if it came, even the Supreme Court judgment judges would have been shaken by it. Because they're all believers too. They believe, they do puja before coming to court. They, 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 they hold their Brahminism and Hinduism uh, uh, not necessarily on their sleeve, but they do hold it. So the belief system is constitution one thing, but the belief system is other, which permeates down at the ground below. And if you change the balance, there is a repercussion that happens, a backlash that happens, which takes the entire movement behind. Because nobody went and talked to devotees before the judgment saying that, you know, a menstruation, you must go, this and that, there is no impurity. Nothing like that has happened. So I feel to uh, what yeah, LGBTQ movement, everybody said, even the previous speaker and Arvind said, it's a long history of movement. The long issues that came up of arrest also, AIDS campaign, various issues. So I feel there is a difference between Sabrimala and this case. Um, the other thing, how do you implement on the ground what's a touchstone? Okay, let me give you the example of triple talaq. Now, today also, after the judgment, even yesterday's meeting, we had a very interesting meeting of Muslims yesterday, Muslim women, Muslim men in Bangalore. And they case, narrated cases and said, uh, he said teen talaq. The issue is that there should be enough activists, lawyers, to challenge that triple talaq and take the woman to court and give her the rights. If that happens, and if this belief spreads, what's the touchstone? Touchstone is that woman coming to me and said, can you help me? And she's poor, she's coming from a slum, she's elated, but I, can, I tell her, I can give you the rights. And that rights that she gets from the court is in a way transformative for the entire community. And it happened because uh, Shami Mara was there, and today uh, Shaira uh, Banu is there, that I can use this judgment to bring transformative changes in the ground. And that if you do not do this, if you same for Sabri Mala, if you do not work on the ground, according to me, these ju judgments are very important for law students, but not necessary for the community that it affects. Um, there were one more question. Uh, what did you, the domestic violence? Before that, there was one question that domestic violence come back. Ah, theology. Yeah, judge. See, I, I want to say Sabri, the triple talaq judgment was purely looking at a particular act. It was not giving a theology at all. Justice Kuri and Joseph, also, everybody. What they said, Justice Kuri and Joseph, it's a small 27 page, uh, his uh, judgment comes sandwiched between these two major judgments. And he says, Shamimar has already declared it. So there is no need to constitutionally test it. All the three judges said there is an act. And this was said that, Indra Jaisi argued that I want to go back and look at um, 
Narsu Apamali. Personal laws are laws in force or not. They say we don't want to go into that because we are looking at an enactment. We are purely looking at enactment. We are not looking at uh, theology. We are not looking at what is written in the Quran. We are only seeing what is written in the act. And when I write also, I look at judgments. And I look at, uh, particularly I look at judgments. What have they said on this issue? Today, what the Quran says is not important. What the law has said on the Quran, that is more important. So, or whether Manu or anybody else. It is, we think that, oh, do you know Sanskrit? Do you know uh, Arabic? Have you read the Quran? I don't need to read any of this. Because today we have a history of judgments for more, or more than 100, 150 years that have come on, which have interpreted everything, agreed, disagreed, whatever. And like what Arvin is so beautifully analyzed, the history and the judgment that came on this issue. Similarly, for Muslim women's issue, we have an entire range of judgments. And we need to understand and analyze that. And you don't need to go anywhere. So this 1937 uh, Act, that is Application of Sharia Act, what does it say? Does it say triple talaq? They said it doesn't say triple talaq. We don't care whether it's theology, not theology, where it is, not there. We don't need to, and I, I don't think any judge should go into theology. They are not experts of theology. Their duty is to look at enactments and whether they come into the constitution for you or not. And when they stick to it, then they are on the safer ground. When they go into the Quran, like Shavanuka Shab did, uh, they are on a very slippery, slippery slope. And that is where they can be attacked. Who are you to interpret our Quran? If I say there's a law was enacted by the legislature, I'm looking at the law. They're very safe. And about your issue, I agree with you. And this reconciliation can be very well done under the Domestic Violence Act. And the court is, has to have mediators and settlement uh, arbitrators to settle the issue. And that becomes binding. If all of NGOs knew this, no, this problem wouldn't happen. But there is a fear among NGOs to go to court. There is constantly the two like diverse things that are happening. All the time we say this law is not sufficient, we need a new law. We need a new law. We need a new law. At the other level, you have a parallel thing going, courts don't work, courts don't work, courts don't work. If courts don't work, why do you need a law? If you tell women don't go to court, nothing happens there, then why are you campaigning for a law? Why do you have a domestic violence act if you think that you can settle the issue? A 15 year struggle, 20 year struggle for the Domestic Violence Act. And at the end of it, you say, oh, the act doesn't work. We will be better than the courts and the judges. How can you even say that? And that is the problem I have with all the people who say we will mediate because we are better. Uh, the judges are supposed to have mediators, and the judges are, and that decision is binding. So now we want to say all mediation things should come under at least the legal aid authority. And they should win an award because that is binding. You don't want to go to court, you go somewhere, but finally you have a consent terms filed before a legal aid authority so that it becomes bind binding. But then you need activist groups who are well versed in law and well versed in activism to do that. And at least, I'm sorry to say, occupies a very unique position of dictating, analyzing, working with the system uh, in doing that. And I don't know how much of it happens here among the women's groups that you talk about. And unless that happens, the change won't come. Thank you, thank you, Sudhir, for time keeping from there. <laughs> yes, uh, I think one of the constitutional values we don't talk about enough in this country is efficiency. Uh, everybody wants to have their freedom of speech, but of course that comes at a cost of not allowing other people to do. And the next panel is on inclusiveness. Uh, so therefore we must yield, but please join me in thanking this wonderful panel. Thank you.